Many people think that criminal cases, including death penalty cases, are won and lost, won or lost, in the selection of the jury. Today we'll talk about how a person goes from their home in the community, gets that summons in the mail, telling them they've got a report for jury duty, and ends up being one of 12 people sitting in a capital case deciding whether a person will live or die. Uh, actually, jury selection is not so much selection as it is excluding people, excluding people who can't be fair and impartial. The parties exclude people with their peremptory strikes. Uh, and finally, when all the dust clears, there are 12 people left and usually two alternates, uh, and those are the people who decide the case. Uh, let's look here quickly at how people go, uh, as I said, from their home to the jury, where they're one of 12 people sitting uh, in the jury box. Uh, we start with whatever the political subdivision is. In uh, many jurisdictions, it's a county. In Louisiana, it's a parish, or it may be a district. If it's federal court, it will be a United States uh, federal district, but those are divided into divisions, usually. Uh, in some states, a jury commission will make the determination that out of the people in that county, let's say, uh, which ones will be included in the jury pool. Uh, other places, it may be done just by computer. Uh, but uh, not everybody who lives in the community will necessarily be in the jury pool. And this is what the litigation has been about with regard to whether or not jury, juries are, are representative or whether there's been discrimination in the selection of the juries. Uh, there's no right to have a jury here, the 12 people that decide the case, no right to have a jury uh, that reflects the composition of the community. But the jury pool must represent roughly the composition of the jury. In other words, if the community is 25% African American and there are only 10% African American Americans in the jury pool, uh, that's a 15% underrepresentation, and that would be the basis for a challenge to the jury pool, saying that it needs to be reconstituted so that it better represents the entire community. By the same token, uh, the jury pool. Uh, we look at race, ethnicity, and also gender. We would assume the jury pool in most communities are going to be about 50-50 men and women. If we see the jury pool has only 30% women, uh, then there's obviously a problem with that. And there are two legal bases for challenging it. One, that there's been discrimination, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause in excluding that group, either by race or by gender. Uh, secondly, uh, that there's been a denial of the Sixth Amendment guarantee of a fair cross-section of the community. And either way, uh, a court will look at what the composition has been over some period of time, uh, how the selection process works, uh, how subjective it is, uh, whether there's some explanation for the disparity, but otherwise uh, the uh, jury will have to be reconstituted so that it more fairly uh, reflects the community. Out of the jury pool, a number of people will be summoned uh, to the courthouse for trials. They'll get a summons in the mail telling them to come to court. Uh, and then once they get to the courthouse, they'll usually go to a jury assembly room, unless it's a very small community where they may go straight to the courtroom. And a group of people will be called what we call the veneer. A group of people will be called uh, to the courtroom for questioning. This is the start of the jury selection process. The first thing is voir dire, the questioning of the jurors, uh, which may be by the judge, maybe by the parties. Uh, but as that questioning has gone on, or at the end of it, uh, each party will be able to strike a certain number of jurors for cause. That is, um, oh, I screwed that up. Let me back up one. The people called to the courtroom, uh, we call this the veneer. These are the people who are going to be summoned to the courtroom, and now we're going to be questioning. Question. This is what the jury process involves, the, what we call voir dire, the questioning of the jurors. And while the jurors are being questioned, one of the things the parties and the court will be looking for is whether there's any reason the juror can't be fair and impartial. And the judge can strike any juror for cause uh, if, they can't, if that juror cannot be fair and impartial. Uh, ultimately, uh, each side will exercise peremptory strikes, which we'll talk about another time. Uh, each side will have a certain number of strikes, 
uh, established usually by a state statute or rule. Uh, and once uh, they strike down, we'll have usually a jury of 12 jurors and two alternates. If the case is expected to last a really long time, uh, there may be four alternates. Uh, the alternates, of course, would substitute for the jurors if for some reason a juror had a family emergency or uh, had a personal emergency or something like that and had to be replaced. Uh, the questioning of jurors, the method is decided uh, pretty much by the judge. Uh, and also to some extent by statute or rule. Uh, it differs from questioning each juror individually. Uh, that is, in Texas, a jury may take, uh, jury selection may take a long time while each juror is brought in one at a time, asked questions by the prosecution, by the defense, uh, and then another juror is brought in. You can imagine that takes some period of time. Uh, in other uh, judges will conduct the jury selection in panels. That is, they'll bring a group of 12 or 13 people or 15 in at one time, and just those people will be questioned. And some of the questions will be group questions to everyone, like raise your hand if you know someone involved in this case. Uh, and some will be individual cases, like Mr. Smith, I see here on your jury questionnaire uh, that you work at a certain place. Would that uh, in any way come into play if you were chosen as a juror? So uh, that's another way to do it. And then a third way is often, and this is particularly true in federal courts, uh, all the jurors may be questioned in one huge group. In other words, the courtroom is full of prospective jurors, and uh, whether the questioning is done by the judge or by the lawyers is, again, often differs from judge to judge and court to court. Uh, in many federal courts, the judge will conduct the jury selection, which will only take a very short period of time. Uh, the judge will tell the jurors about the case, ask them if there's any reason they can't be fair and impartial, ask a few other questions. Uh, the jurors are to respond by raising their hand if the answer is yes to those questions, but most people won't say anything, and so the actual striking of the jury uh, will take place without either side knowing very much about those jurors, if we're in a place that has a large population. Of course, if we're in a small jurisdiction, uh, it may very well be that everybody knows everybody, uh, that the prosecutor through the sheriff's deputies and other people uh, knows uh, about all the jurors, if not knows them in, in fact, and by the same token, the defense may very well know the people. The other point I'd make here is that what the jury is going to look like is going to depend very much upon the county or the parish from which the jury is chosen. Uh, if you have a white flight suburban community, that is a community in which there are almost no people of color, 95% white population, then the jurors who are summoned to the courtroom are probably going to be about 95% white. Uh, and so the likelihood that there are going to be any people of color on that jury is, is pretty slim. On the other hand, if you're in a more diverse community uh, where a third of the population uh, is African American, then you should see that reflected uh, in, the ju in the jurors who are summoned uh, to court. Um, and then the question for strikes for cause is basically can the juror be fair and impartial on any subject? I'm going to talk about the three that come up the most, uh, but there can be uh, others as well. Has the juror heard about the case in a lot of cases? where there's been a lot of media attention to the case, a lot of social media attention, a lot of talking about the case in small communities, uh, one of the concerns is going to be, uh, do the jurors already have their minds made up uh, because of what they've read or what they've seen about the case? Uh, secondly, less often asked, but I want to be sure to touch on it, is racial bias. Do the jurors have any racial prejudice which might come into play, particularly if it's white jurors and they're sitting on an interracial crime. Supreme Court has recognized a right to ask questions about that. And then third, uh, what are the jurors' attitudes on the death penalty? Uh, because it may be that some people either feel so strongly in favor of the death penalty uh, that they can't be fair and impartial, or there may be and probably will be more people uh, who for religious, conscientious or other reasons are opposed to the death penalty and wouldn't consider the death penalty any, under any circumstances. Uh, those people uh, will probably be excluded unless they're able to put those views aside. Same thing with pretrial publicity. 
The question will be, you've heard about the case, you've read about it, maybe you've talked about it, but can you put that aside and decide the case just on the evidence that you hear in court? Um, and then once those uh, strikes, uh, once the court has decided who struck for cause, uh, each side exercises a certain number of peremptory strikes, the prosecution and the defense. Uh, for a long time, uh, you could exercise a peremptory strike for any reason, and you didn't have to give a reason. The parties did not. Uh, but now, uh, a party cannot strike based on race or gender uh, unless there is a race or gender neutral reason for it. And we'll talk more about that in another segment, uh, but whether that works or not is certainly subject uh, to debate. And again, the method of, 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 of striking jurors may vary uh, judge by judge, court by court. In courts where the jurors are examined one at a time, it may be that right after each juror is questioned, the party exercised a peremptory strike. Of course, it's hard to do that because you don't know what all the other jurors look like. Uh, in courts that uh, question people in panels, it may be that after each panel, let's say 12, is questioned, each side goes in chambers with the judge out of the presence of the jury, and each side makes its motions to strike for cause. I don't think that person can be fair because of what they read about the case. The judge grants or denies. Then the judge may call upon the parties to exercise their peremptory strikes. In other words, each side may have 10 strikes. And so right then, the judge may call upon a party saying, uh, do you accept these people or, or do you strike? Or uh, what is at least uh, often done in, in many jurisdictions is you qualify the number of people you need to choose the jury. Uh, so for example, if each side had 10 strikes plus two strikes for an alternate, uh, you would qualify 38 people. And then each side would exercise 12 strikes. And that would leave you with a jury of 12 and two alternates. So all of these uh, methods of jury selection differ. Well, another thing I should say is that very often, not only is there the questioning of the jurors, but judges uh, often allow a jury questionnaire uh, to be circulated. Some jury questionnaires are very extensive. They may go on for 15 or 20 pages. Some jury questionnaires may be two pages. So again, the discretion of the judge, how the judge allows this process to take place. Uh, and some jury selection process is very elaborate with long questionnaires, individual questioning of jurors, in other places, and, and this is in capital cases as well as non-capital cases, uh, the jury selection may be very perfunctory, uh, as it was in the Moomin case, uh, which we will, will, will talk about. Uh, because the question comes, uh, what, what can you ask? What can a party, let's say a person represented, representing Moomin in his case in Virginia, uh, what can you ask the jurors? Uh, he was uh, accused of a murder uh, while he was in a prison work crew. Uh, 47 newspaper articles. Uh, not only did they tell about the murder he was accused of, but an earlier murder he had been involved in. Also told about his confession. Uh, said he had been rejected for parole six times. So the defense had some reason to be concerned that if people had read these things, they might not be fair and impartial. They might already think that he's guilty of the, of the crime because it got a lot of publicity. Uh, the first thing a lawyer does in that situation for a, a person facing the death penalty is move for a change of venue. Move the case to another county uh, where people haven't heard anything about the case and have a very, you know, don't bring any of this knowledge uh, into the jury box. Uh, seldom is a change of venue granted, partly with elected judges. It's uh, politically uh, often not a, a good idea to move the, the, the trial out of the community where people want to decide both guilt and punishment. Uh, and what judges will often do is what happened in the Moomin case. The Virginia judge there said, well, we'll question the jurors and then we will see uh, whether or not they can be fair and impartial. If they can, we'll have the trial here. Uh, if they can't, then we'll will change the venue. Uh, so uh, once the change of venue was denied, uh, Moomin wanted, or his lawyers, uh, wanted the judges to ask uh, questions about what the jurors had seen about the case, read, heard about the case, so-called content questions. Of course, if you do that in a group, it doesn't work because if one person stands up and says, well, I heard he confessed to the crime, uh, 
and goes into some detail in describing it than all the other jurors hear it. So you have to pretty much do that uh, one at a time. Uh, but in this case, the judge just simply questioned all the jurors as a group and would not ask about what they had read or heard, just simply ask, can you keep an open mind? Can you wait until the case is presented uh, before reaching a decision about guilt or innocence? Uh, and so some people were struck when they answered those questions, uh, and then each side struck uh, six jurors, uh, 14 people were seated, 12 jurors, and 12, uh, two alternates. So Moomin's case makes it all the way to the United States Supreme Court on the question of, did he have an adequate opportunity to get a fair jury? Because he wasn't allowed to ask these questions. Uh, and here Justice Rehnquist writes for the court on a very close call, five to four opinion by the Supreme Court, and says that the content questions are not constitutionally required. He points out that if you had the content questions, you'd have to ask each juror individually. And for this court, uh, saving time, what's most expeditious, very important consideration. Uh, and then secondly, the wide discretion that judges have in all of these areas, that the judge has a lot of discretion in how to conduct uh, jury selection, and if the judge wants to do it in a big group, they can, uh, but that the Constitution at least doesn't reach this far. And Sandra Day O'Connor writes a concurring opinion. She was the swing vote uh, in this case. Uh, and she said it would have been helpful had the jurors answered these questions. It certainly would have been more, uh, the judge would have been better able to make decisions about how fair and impartial the jurors could be if the judge knew what the answers to the questions were, what they had read and, and what they had heard. But she said the Constitution uh, doesn't require that. The Sixth Amendment doesn't require that. And here we see what we see from time to time. The court says, here's what the constitutional floor is. You've at least got to do whatever. But if a state wants to, if a judge wants to ask more questions, Justice O'Connor is saying it would be a good idea to ask more questions, but it's not required by the Constitution. So she uh, is the fifth vote here, which now means that uh, juries can be selected in any jurisdiction in sort of the very uh, superficial way uh, that the jury was selected in this case. Uh, Justice Marshall dissents. He points out that the assurances of jurors, this, this system basically lets the jurors decide whether they can be fair and impartial, as opposed to a judge hearing everything a juror knows about a case, what opinions they may have formed, what conversations they may have had with their spouse or their children or their neighbors. Uh, and then the judge makes a decision that even though this person thinks he or she may be fair and impartial, perhaps they know a little too much, or perhaps they've said a little too much if they've said, you know, they ought to hang that guy. Uh, if you knew that, uh, a judge might make a different decision. If you just ask a person to, en masse, raise your hand, uh, if you're not able to be fair and impartial, uh, not many hands are going to be raised. Uh, Justice Kennedy, who's usually the swing vote, this time is a dissenting, uh, writes a dissenting opinion, uh, and he said, you just can't rely upon silence by jurors to questions as to the whole group and mass. Uh, so it's a close decision, uh, but because of Justice O'Connor's uh, voting uh, the way that she did, uh, the court upholds Moomin's uh, jury selection process. Um, what about the racial attitudes uh, of the jurors? Uh, several cases important. Uh, to this, I want to just touch on a couple lightly, and then we'll talk about Turner versus Murray. In Ham versus South Carolina, uh, the defendant, Ham, wanted to ask questions about race and what the jurors' racial attitudes were. Would you disregard his race if you were chosen as a juror? And do you have any prejudice uh, against black people? Uh, and have you used the term black, which at the time of this case in 1973, uh, had not been used as much as, of course, it has been uh, since that time. Uh, the judge would not allow those questions. And the Supreme Court held that that was error and that Ham was entitled to a new trial. But it was because of the facts of the case. Justice Rehnquist writes the opinion, and he says, in this case, Ham's whole defense was that he was being prosecuted because he was active in the civil rights movement, and he was, uh, the law enforcement agencies were out to get him 
uh, because of his civil rights activities. So issues of civil rights, race, were front and center in this case. And in this case, he had a right under the Due Process Clause to ask the court, to ask the jurors about their racial attitudes. But then the court in another case, just a few years later, Rostano versus Ross, uh, decides that that's not required in a case, even though it was a case involving three African Americans charged with the murder of a white person. Uh, the court said because race wasn't inextricably tied up in the case, in fact, the case was not about race, it was just a, a, a crime, but it was black on white, excuse me, black on white. The, the defendants were black, uh, the victim was white. Uh, the Supreme Court had earlier said, way back in 1931, uh, in the Aldridge case, uh, the court had said, uh, in response to some justices saying it would be too much trouble to ask these questions, uh, the majority of the court had said it would be better to take the time to ask these questions than to have people speculate about how much race may have played a role in the decision. Well, the court in Rostano decides that that's not a constitutional rule. That's just a rule that the court adopted for lower federal courts as a, in its supervisory power over lower courts. And so hell that uh, the race questions weren't required uh, in this case. Now that doesn't mean that a trial judge might not ask those questions, uh, but the court is saying they're not constitutionally required. And then Willie Lloyd Turner's case comes along. Uh, this is a case again out of Virginia. Murray was the warden or the, at, at the prison where Turner was held, and Willie Lloyd Turner brought his case up on the grounds that uh, the jurors in his trial, he had wanted to ask questions about their racial attitudes and wasn't allowed to. Uh, here, the Supreme Court says the questioning was required in Turner's case because of it being an interracial case and secondly, being a capital case. Uh, the court pointed out the discretion that jurors have in capital sentencing. That basically, unlike deciding whether a person meets the four elements of a crime, uh, there's a great deal of discretion uh, in how jurors view mitigating evidence, aggravating evidence, victim impact evidence, and make decisions in death penalty cases. So there's a lot of discretion. And then secondly, uh, jurors might, in exercising that discretion, be influenced by their racial attitudes. And the court even suggests that the jurors might be uh, affected by their unconscious racial attitudes. This is quite a uh, remarkable recognition on the part of the court because almost all the court cases about race discrimination is about intentional race discrimination. Here the court is not saying these jurors would intentionally discriminate but they're saying they may have attitudes, they may have stereotypes, they may be afraid of black people, uh, they may have subtle biases that they don't even realize they have themselves. Uh, and there's some chance uh, that they would uh, come into play. So the court holds that it violated uh, Turner's uh, right to an impartial jury because of the unacceptable risk, not that racial bias was proven, but the failure to ask the questions resulted in an unacceptable risk that race might uh, play, away, uh, play a role. But the remedy the court gives is almost completely inadequate to deal with the problem of unconscious discrimination. Uh, the court says the judge has the discretion, uh, the jurors can be questioned individually, or they can be questioned as a group. Uh, all they have to be told is that this is an interracial crime as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman sitting at council table is an African American. Uh, I'm telling you that the victim in this case was white or Caucasian. Uh, would any of you have any racial bias that would come into play if you were chosen to sit on this case? Of course, almost no one is going to raise their hand in answer to that question. So uh, the courts can do very little. Uh, in response to Turner. Also, these questions are asked only if the defense lawyer asks for them. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, it's waived. But some courts will grant questioning and will grant questioning individually of jurors about racial attitudes in which there are opportunities to really engage jurors about convers in conversations about race. Uh, what do they think of the segregated schools, the all-white uh, segregation academy, and do they send their children there? 
Uh, what do they think about whatever the racial attitudes in the community are? Uh, do they think that the defendant has anything to worry about uh, with regard to race in this community? Not what they personally think, but in the community. It's possible to have a conversation, and out of that conversation, the lawyers can get some sense uh, of what the jurors' attitudes are with regard to race. Uh, some jurors will be fairly open about it. Uh, some jurors will be very uh, closed and, and, and uh, almost unwilling to talk about it. Uh, those things tell lawyers things uh, that they may use when they make strikes of the jurors uh, later on. In Turner's case, the Supreme Court upheld his conviction uh, but set aside his death sentence. So the case was sent back uh, just simply for a trial on sentence. As it turned out, Turner was resentenced to death even uh, when the questions were asked at his second trial, and he was ultimately put to death by the state of Virginia. Um, the next question is the jurors' attitudes on the death penalty. Uh, this is usually something, depending upon the community, that's going to take a lot of time during jury selection. I've been in communities where when you ask the question, is anybody opposed to the death penalty, uh, not a single person says a word, so there's no questioning to be done there, at least on that part of it. Uh, but in many communities, there will be a number of people who will have some religious or other scruples against the death penalty. Before the Witherspoon case was decided, Witherspoon versus Illinois in 1968, courts would just simply ask people to raise their hand if they were opposed to the death penalty and they would excuse them. Uh, but the Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, it shouldn't be that easy uh, and that that was excluding too many people in the community for jury service. So. Uh, they said two things, said them both in footnotes. Uh, in this case, the footnotes are more important than the written opinion. Uh, the court said they, that a juror can't be excluded unless that juror states unambiguously that he or she would automatically, these became the critical words in jury selection for many years, that the person would automatically vote against the death penalty. Uh, or if the jurors didn't make it unmistakably clear. And what this meant was when an appellate court reviewed the case, when the state Supreme Court or a federal court on habeas corpus reviewed the case, it had to be unmistakably clear in the transcript of the jury selection that the juror would automatically vote against the death penalty. So what this meant is there wasn't the usual deference to trial judges. And so for many years after the Witherspoon case was decided, uh, a lot of death penalty cases were set aside uh, based upon uh, people's uh, answers to the questions about whether they could decide death penalty cases or, or not. Uh, Witherspoon was decided two years after the Gallup poll had shown that for the only time in the history of the United States, more people were opposed to the death penalty than for it. 47% opposed, 42% in favor. Uh, since that time, uh, support for the death penalty has gone up as high as 70% and then receded uh, back to something much lower than that. Uh, but you can see in the court's opinion uh, how it sees that the death penalty is, as it says, uh, on the way out. Justice Stewart uh, says a death qualified jury, that is jurors who uh, only made up of people who will vote for the death penalty can speak for only a distinct and dwindling minority. Uh, the state has produced a jury that is uncommonly willing uh, to uh, condemn a person to die. Uh, and that Illinois has stacked the deck. This is very, uh, the dissenting opinions don't like this language at all, that Illinois has stacked the deck and given uh, Mr. Witherspoon a hanging jury. Well, just as black, Harlan, and white uh, are quite uh, upset with that characterization of what's going on. After all, this is the way capital jurors had been selected all the way up until the time uh, Witherspoon's jury was selected, and actually until Witherspoon's case was before the Supreme Court in 1968. But it had quite an effect on who could serve on capital juries and who could not. And unless it was unmistakably clear that the person would automatically vote against the death penalty. In other words, that the person could say, I would consider death. I probably wouldn't consider it very long, but I would consider it. It would be very hard to exclude that person. Well, the Supreme Court started changing that uh, as uh, 
soon as it could, first in a case out of Texas in 1980 called Adams versus Texas, but that case sort of did not really get noticed. The case that got noticed was Wainwright versus Witt, uh, which was decided uh, in 1985. And here the court did two things that are critically important. It changed the grounds for disqualification. It no longer was whether it was automatically vote against the death penalty. It was whether a person's views about the death penalty would prevent or substantially impair their ability to consider death as a punishment. So that was a difference there. The second difference, even a bigger one, the court replaced the requirement that the juror's ability to serve be unmistakably clear and instead defers to the trial judge. In other words, now instead of the appellate court looking at the transcript of the jury selection and saying it's not unmistakably clear here that this juror cannot be fair and impartial because he or she will not consider the death penalty as a punishment. Uh, now the court says once there's this back and forth between the, maybe the judge and the juror or the parties, the lawyers for each party and the jurors, the judge at the end of that time says I'm striking this juror because I don't think he or she can be fair and impartial because of their views on the death penalty. Now appellate courts are going to defer to what the trial judges did. And not only that, they're going to assume that the trial judge knew what the law was and applied it correctly. Then in other words, the, the trial judge knew what the law was and made a factual determination based on the demeanor of the juror, how the juror answered the questions, all sorts of atmospherics that are seen there in the courtroom but may not be in an appellate record. So this was a great change in two regards uh, with regard to death qualification. And once Witt versus Wainwright was decided, fewer and fewer cases, more and more uh, was it unlikely that a case would be reversed based upon uh, some person sitting on the jury uh, or being excluded from the jury. That really is the issue that would go up as a, uh, the defense would object to striking the person the state would say, I move to strike this juror because she can't fairly consider the death penalty and the judge would grant that and that would be the issue on appeal. And that became less and less of an appellate issue once Wainwright versus Witt was decided. Uh, the court decided a couple of other uh, points with regard to the death qualification of jurors or, or what jurors could be asked. Uh, two lower federal courts had held that uh, the death qualification, uh, that because you take off the jury all the people who are opposed to the death penalty or have scruples against it, uh, that you have a jury that is prosecution prone and you obviously have a jury that's more likely to give the death penalty. And those courts also had said that uh, you don't have a fair cross-section of the community when you've excluded that part of the community that opposes the death penalty. Well, the Supreme Court reversed a case out of the Eighth Circuit, Lockhart versus McCree, reversed both cases. The other case was out of the Fourth Circuit uh, and said that death qualification does not uh, deny a defendant a fair cross-section of the community. Uh, the fair cross-section applies only to the veneer, to the jury pool that we were talking about before. Uh, it, it, and, and, and secondly, uh, when we're talking about a fair cross-section, we're talking about the exclusion of race, ethnicity, gender, uh, but not people's attitudes on an issue. Uh, so. Uh, people with uh, opposition to the death penalty, the court said, are not uh, a distinct group. Uh, the court then went on to look at the fact that, well, what about the fact that this is not a fair jury because it's so prosecution prone? Uh, and the court said that uh, death qualification was, was not such uh, that it denied a person a fair trial and that it would be so cumbersome uh, to select a jury, try a case, and then qualify, ask the jurors about their attitudes on the death penalty and then try the penalty phase, uh, that it would be, as the court said, hopelessly impractical. So again, considerations of efficiency, uh, administration, uh, judicial economy uh, are the determining uh, considerations here with the court and it rejected those claims and uh, they uh, have not been heard since. Practicalities basically uh, triumphed uh, over this claim uh, that the jurors couldn't be fair and were very prosecution prone and very likely to impose death. The other case that's important to mention is Morgan versus Illinois. Here the case basically, the court basically said uh, that just as you can ask if a person is opposed to the death penalty, 
and therefore will not consider imposing the death penalty. Uh, you can also ask people whether they're so in favor of the death penalty for certain crimes uh, that they can't consider a sentence of life imprisonment or life imprisonment without parole. And there will be jurors who will be excluded. There will be jurors who say, if it's a police officer killing case, say, I think somebody that committed that crime should get the death penalty. And I don't think any other punishment is enough. That person may be excluded for the same reason another person would be excluded when that person said, I'm religiously opposed to the death penalty. Uh, I could consider life imprisonment, but I could not ever vote for the death penalty. Uh, in some jurisdictions, jurors have three choices, and, and sometimes even more, uh, death penalty, life imprisonment without parole, and life imprisonment with parole. And sometimes jurors will say, I could consider death, I could consider life imprisonment without parole, but I couldn't consider parole, a, a sentence that would uh, be uh, parole eligible for this defendant, given what he's accused of. And, and those people may be excluded uh, for that reason. Very much discretion uh, on the part of the trial judge here in deciding how to grant these uh, motions to strike jurors. Uh, we get into the question of what does it mean to consider? Because a person who's religiously opposed to the death penalty, for example, will never consider the death penalty. That person is opposed to the death penalty. Many African Americans are excluded uh, during this death qualification process because they will say, well, I'm opposed to the death penalty. Uh, it's been used to discriminate against black people throughout the history of the United States, and, and I, I think it should not be used anymore. Uh, and I would never vote to send anybody to death. Well, that person is excluded. But then you have the person who says, I strongly am in favor of the death penalty. I think the death penalty should be imposed in this kind of case. I'm not sure any other punishment would really be adequate. But the judge turns to the person and says, well, could you consider life without parole? Oh, yeah, I could consider life without parole. You have the sense it may be a rather fleeting consideration. But this person has no religious objections to life without parole. The person just simply doesn't think it's, severe, it's a severe enough sentence. But the person who's against the death penalty may have religious or other reasons uh, which would never allow them to vote for the death penalty. So the result of this can often be that the jury is somewhat skewed with the people who are uh, opposed to the death penalty all being excluded and with many people who have strong views in favor of the death penalty uh, remaining on the jury because they say they can consider the alternative of life imprisonment uh, without parole. But one final case uh, which takes us full circle on the death qualification and that's Utec versus Brown. Uh, decided by the Supreme Court in 2007. Uh, the juror here was identified only as Juror Z in the court's opinion. It was a referee, basketball referee. His brother was a police officer, so just based upon that, uh, you would think that he might not be a bad jury, a juror for the prosecution. Uh, here's what's interesting about, at least in my view, that case. One, he was not, he had no objections to the death penalty. This was not like what we see often, which is a juror takes a stand and the judge says, what's your opinion of the death penalty? You say, I'm opposed to the death penalty. I, I have religious scruples against the death penalty. Uh, I can never impose that. This juror didn't impose the death penalty, uh, didn't oppose the death penalty. Uh, he had no problem with it, but he was asked a very kind of broad question, when would the death penalty be appropriate? And he was very confused in his answers. Uh, and he worried about that the person might be released, even though uh, he was told more than once about life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Uh, he, he seemed not to completely understand it, but he repeated, uh, I believe in the death penalty. Uh, the judge uh, granted the strike. The prosecution moved to strike the juror uh, for cause, said that this juror couldn't be fair and impartial, uh, because of his views about the death penalty, uh, and that was upheld by the Supreme Court uh, in this case. So we've gone full circle from uh, Witherspoon, where a jury had to make it unmistakably clear that their views about the death penalty were so strong that they would automatically vote against the death penalty in every case, to Utec versus Brown, where the court says simply because the juror expresses some confusion,
uh, and doesn't, sometimes you see cases where the jurors just don't want to be involved in deciding whether another person is going to live or die, uh, and the trial judge excludes that person, uh, that's going to be sustained. Uh, so uh, now very much the question of who sits on the jury, given their attitudes about the death penalty, is very much up to the trial judge that tries that case, and very seldom uh, is the trial judge's decision on that uh, going to be reversed by an appellate court because the trial judge there sees the jury. This is going to be true in all of these areas, how we conduct the voir dire, what questions are asked, and then the ultimate choice or decision that a trial judge makes in these cases, which is whether or not that juror can be fair and impartial. Uh, parties may appeal it, but there's going to be a lot of discretion given to the judge in those situations. And so that concludes a discussion of just a very basic overview uh, of the jury selection process with regard to uh, questioning jurors and determining if they can be fair and impartial. Uh, in another segment, we'll turn to the use of the peremptory strikes in which the parties are able, the prosecutor and the defense lawyer, are able to strike people from jury service.